Welcome, everyone, to the Sports Writers Podcast. Here they are, Matt Williams of the Salem News, Nick Giannino of the Salem News. We're expecting Phil Stacy to join us shortly. We're recording on a Tuesday evening here. And Nick Giannino, we're going to lead you off here because I know you can't stay the whole uh, the whole three hours with us here for this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, t- tell us, uh, you were at a, at a soccer mat game this afternoon, right? What's What do you have for us? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, actually, perfect, perfect time to highlight the Beverly Panthers. I uh, saw them get a nice five nothing win over Salem today. Um, they're having a nice season now, seven three and two. Uh, one of the better teams in the NEC, and I was really impressed with them today. Um, you know, even speaking with the the Salem coach after the game, Padraig Slattery, they've they've faced a lot of good opponents, and he said that was the best team that they faced he thought um you know they had a tough loss against gloucester in the opener gloucester's having a terrific season but beverly uh just their depth and their balance um you know their leading scorer wilson de leon who's having a terrific year um as a senior captain didn't score today um and you know they 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 relied on some other guys uh like i mentioned just that depth um very impressive i thought they dominated possession and uh, put a lot of shots on goal. They they generated a ton of corner kicks, scored a couple off corner kicks. They had a freshman, uh, Connor Sullivan, I believe is his name, get a goal and an assist. So they got some guys coming up the woodwork from JV and, and some younger guys too that are going to be key pieces moving forward for this team in, in future years. But, um, you know, Edgar De Leon runs a great program over there and uh, they're having another fantastic year, obviously, in, in Division One, so it's uh, kind of a gauntlet in that bracket. But they're hoping to host a playoff game this year. That's a goal of theirs, and I think it's well within reach. I haven't checked the, the rankings this week yet, but they're up there and in, uh, well inside the top 32, somewhere around 20, I believe, um, you know, in Division One. So impressive stuff from the Panthers, and they got to – they got a big stretch right now. I think they have like eight games in 15 days, uh, according to their coach. So they just had a, a, a nice one nothing win over Andover over the weekend, I believe. A division, another Division One, tough Division One team. Um, so yeah, really good stuff from them. Just some players uh, to highlight: Gustavo Majoli. I, I wrote about him a, a few weeks ago. He's an Italian foreign exchange student. Yeah. He scored two goals today. He's a nice piece to have. Um, Pietro. Fusco, I believe is his name, had a nice game for them. Obviously, Wilson, Owen McCarthy is their other captain. He does a little bit of everything for them. Uh, They played good defense. You know, their keeper, uh, Connor Conley, I believe is his name, had a nice uh, game in net, even though he didn't face a ton of shots. You know, he kind of controls things from the back. So really like what I've been seeing from from Beverly. I, I saw them twice now this year. That was my second time seeing them. They had a 2-2 2-2 tie against Peabody, another really great team. Um, so they've been, I think Edgar De Leon, their coach, put it best. They're winning the games that they should be winning, and they're competing well in the games that they have a chance in. So, you know, no blowouts, no blowout losses or anything like that. They've been competitive pretty much every time out on the pitch, and they're healthy right now. Um, they just got a lot of different players they can go to, so. They've been a fun team to watch, and I think just the NEC in general has been uh, very competitive this year. You know, um, Maskinomet still doesn't have a loss. They seem to be, uh, you know, pulling out wins left and right. They have a couple ties, I believe, but, you know, they battle. They 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 hold teams off the scoreboard, and that's largely been a, a key for them. They had a huge win against Winthrop today. I just saw it come in. It was like 8-1 or something, but most of their games have, have been 2-1, 2-0, 1-0, you know. Uh, tight wins and so Masco is another team to watch uh, up in division two uh, Swampskit is one of the better teams in division three they're having a fantastic season Peabody is obviously a threat in division one too so uh, the NEC has been fun it's been competitive there's been some really good soccer this fall good stuff um, well Phil um, I think Phil is going to join us here in just a moment but Nick let's get going on football here you and I were both at the uh, Salem Gloucester game uh last Friday. So maybe you can share with us your take on that and a game where classical uh, runs up over 400 yards of passing had opportunities for more to be quite honest with you, but it's Salem coming away with that 48 44 win, um, you know, with the, with the, the winning touchdown with 13 seconds to play. Yeah. What a wild game. Uh, you know, me and you were both in there, Bill crowded press box. Uh, it was a big game for both teams. 19 years it had been since Salem had beat, 
Lynn Classical, that's been well documented now, and they they really showed up for the game. It, it felt like when they got that ball with three and a half minutes or so left that they were going to score because every time whatever team had the ball, they were running down the field and they were scoring. I mean, it was just back and forth the whole game, and I don't want to say no defense. It was just better offense. I thought it was really good offense. Um, you know, Salem got beat on a couple long balls. Uh, obviously, Lynn Classical, the, the quarterback there, and his – Two wide receivers' um, names are escaping me right now. Fessler, Fessler, and um, uh, Fessler and Nestor. Uh, na- um, John Nasky. 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 John Nasky. Nasky. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah those two kids uh, know how to get open, and they got wow. some next level speed. So um, they got deep a couple times. You know, there was also some some touchdowns called back, some big runs. I think a yeah. couple kickoff returns called back, maybe. And yeah, another- yeah. Seventy yard run or something that was called back. So both teams showed off their explosiveness, um, but Salem just stuck with it. And that final drive was a thing of beauty. They converted on on fourth down, uh, fourth and seven. You know, inside their own thirty yard line. Devontae Azuna picks one up there to extend the drive, and then obviously they get down uh, into the red zone there, and they score with thirteen seconds left. And, Albert Pujols comes down with the ball in the back of the end zone off a kind of a broken play. I think Corey was trying, Corey Grimes, the quarterback of Salem, who had a great game. He's having a terrific season. Um, was trying to get the ball to Ozuna in the corner of the end zone and, and Pujols, you know, audibled off his route and swooped in over to the corner and caught that ball and toe tapped it in. So uh, that was quite the play. And obviously a big game for them, a big moment for them. They were very emotional after the win, but yeah, that was a fun one to watch. You know, you talk about maybe the lack of defense at times, but uh, the first half at the half, it was 18-18. Yep. Each team with three touchdowns, each team could not convert on two-point conversion. And that actually continued to be a struggle for classical, although I think they got one or two uh, point, you know, uh, two-point conversions, but maybe just one. They might have got one and Sam yeah. might have had two. And one of them yes. came on the, you know, the winning touchdown, which they right. didn't end up needing the two-point. I think that uh, was it. Yeah, the two extra. But that was two- it. Yeah, they were, yeah. For 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 two offensive teams that were really uh, you know slinging the ball and finding open space all game for whatever reason they couldn't punch home the the two point conversions and neither uh, I don't think Lynn even attempted a kick and Salem had no. a extra point blocked and another one go wide so they went right. to the conversions but um, yeah I mean this could have been a game that was in the fifties if if some of those conversions were. Uh, you know, successful, um, but terrific game. And going back to Grimes too, the kid, the kid plays everywhere. He plays quarterback. He plays on defense. He kicks the ball. And on defense, he had some big tackles, some hard hitting tackles. Um, so impressive stuff from him. And yeah, I think Salem. We've talked about him on the podcast before, but this just solidifies them as a real contender in Division Six. Nick, I know you have to run, so I'll let you go here. But we appreciate you grabbing us uh, here right after your game and so on. And uh, yep, we'll talk yep. again. Yeah. No, my pleasure. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, yeah, guys. thank you. Well, there he is. Bill Stacy has arrived here. And uh, wow, it's one in, you. one out here. We we yeah. got a team match. We we got uh, I don't know the natural disasters maybe. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to be known as that, but okay. Legion of Doom, uh, demolition. I don't know. Yeah, how about Gaelic and garlic? I don't know. That's fine. You know. Yeah, that could work. Yeah, we could do that. Oh man. Uh, well, well, last week Matt was uh, Harvey Specter here on our podcast. <laughs> uh, right. But <laughs> and then I've seen some tweets very, very articulately uh, put together here by you, Matt, this week. But anyways, I, I don't know who I, that. I, I don't know who that makes you, Bill. I'll, I'll leave that up to interpretation. Oh my gosh, me? Uh, no. Uh, uh, I'm Rachel. Okay, so no, let's well, go. Uh, <laughs> don't tell Prince Harry that. I mean, no, my no, no. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, so we got sidetracked. Uh, hey, I. Bef- speaking of sidetracked, I got this for you for you guys here. Uh, I checked in with the uh, Danvers football captains today, and I've got some great news that uh, Travis Voisin, their quarterback, checks out the podcast here. Oh, there you go. Really? There you go. They're, yeah, we like that letter of love. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm so, a southpaw, uh, you know. So uh, yeah, they, uh, we uh, MSO News Sports did a feature with the five captains there. Uh, they're putting some wins together there, and great kids. And uh, and Travis, we had some downtime for a minute before we started, and he was telling me 
Yeah, he just checks out the podcast. He didn't drop any names like, oh, I like that Phil or Matt or, or anybody, but uh, he just liked it. And I told him, check it out tonight. See what, see how it goes. You know, you know he, didn't we say, talk- uh, he didn't say I check it out to watch you jabronis or anything like that. It was just, I check out the podcast. Yeah, I, 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 I watch and listen because you guys are crazy pathetic. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Willie could uh, talk to their more recent uh, game action, but they've obviously hit their stride um, four wins in a row going into this Friday's home game. And they'll be certainly favored against a masculine team that has struggled is one and three. Um, you know, we've talked about this for a few years now, but there's certainly a method to the madness of um, Ryan Nolan's scheduling when he goes and he starts the season with a Tewksbury and a Redding. And this year they had Salem sandwiched in between. Um I saw that Salem uh, Damas game and as close as their game was against classical last week and came right down to the wire. That Salem Danvers game was a close game. I mean, I know it was a touchdown game, but Danvers had a couple of chances, uh, especially early in that game to punch it in. They, they very well could have beaten Salem early on, but they didn't. And that's fine. I think they learned from their two early losses and they're, they're rolling along nicely. Now they're relatively healthy. They have certainly gotten uh, Owen Gasanowski, um, Going, I, I saw Willie had what thirty one carries last week. I mean, he he really takes that uh, bell cow, um, yes, standard to, to heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah thirty one carries. Plus, I mean, he he so he he had thirty one carries plus five catches, his thirty six touches, and uh, Swamps could only ran twenty seven offensive plays. So, um, you know, it was keep away for the Falcons, and it worked. And you know, obviously, two fumbles uh, helped that uh, cause along. Yeah. Uh, you know, on kickoffs and, and, you know, it was 27, 14 and, and coach Bush for Swampscott was just lamenting that fact. I mean, geez, you know, we lose two possessions because we can't, you know, handle the ball on kickoffs and, and it's a two possession game. So, uh, you know, that was that, but, uh, you know, we, we haven't talked a ton about Danvers. I, I feel like, you know, ever since the Salem loss, they've, they've been a little bit under the radar here, but I, I like what they're doing. You know, they, they figured out some things offensively. Um, yeah. You know, that, that that offense really struggled in the early going and, and it didn't look super creative and, and look like maybe it was going to be a, a, a bit of a slog. And no, they only had two they, touchdowns uh, uh, combined the first two weeks. You're right. And the more they've worked on it, the better it's gotten. You know, it, it's reps, it's it's practice, it, it's it's coaching, it's taking the coaching and listening, and and they've gotten better and they've developed faith in it. Um, you, you know, there I, just aren't that many teams that are that are running formations with you know ten guys in the box and a fullback, and and Danvers is doing it, and they're finding ways to have success with it. And, and I like you know when they when they do go to a, a slot formation. I love the way Voisin drives the ball. You know, I, I asked Coach Ryan Nolan about that. Uh, you know, is it his experience? Is it, uh, you know, j- just his, his? he's a three-year starter, four-year starter, really. Four-year you starter, remember, yeah. You know, he got pressed into action as a freshman when the starting quarterback broke his hand in the second or third game. Yeah, yeah the COVID so, season, right. So, uh, so you're playing an unfamiliar time of year. You're thrust into a starting role. I mean, you can say that season didn't mean anything. Uh, in the big picture, there are no playoffs or whatnot. But for both him and Gastonowski, both put into those roles as freshmen, uh, you know, 15-year-old boys playing against 18-year-old men, uh, that was a, certainly a baptism by fire. Yeah, I, I just, you know, and Coach said, yeah, he drives the ball. I thought that was just a perfect way to describe his best throws. Uh, you know, I'm supposed to be the writer, but it was it was no one that came up with the good word on that one, drive. I just, on the crossing patterns, uh, the way he can put his foot in the ground and, and just put the ball exactly where either Gazanowski or Mativia are going to be. Um, mm-hmm. That's really nice to see. It, it reminds me a little bit of some of the stuff they used to do with, with Brendan Tracy back in the day when they used to be able to get third down conversions on bootlegs and stuff like that. I, I thought, um, you know, it, it was the most cohesive and, and, and um, you know, crisp is the word I'm looking for that, that Danvers offense ha- has been. And, and I think a lot of that is a credit uh, to the line, of course, you know, yeah. the right side uh, with Gazowski and, and Rogers and Nugent uh, was absolutely dominant, but, but it's also a big credit to Travis and, and his ability to, you know, make those throws in the clutch. I mean, you know, for all the yards that Gazanowski chewed up on the ground, they were two or three really clutch throws along the sidelines to Mativier, uh, you know, that produced first downs and, and then the two touchdown passes 
to Gazanowski in the end zone were just dimes. I mean, just great throws. So, um, well, you make a couple great. of really good points there. I think the cohesiveness of the line is a big thing, and they've had to do some rework in there, move some guys around. They, they lost Bubba Roach for the season to an injury rep there. He was a vi- valuable piece of that line. So they've had to, to rejigger some things, and it, and it seems to be they, they have the mix that they're looking for right now. I think another uh, positive thing, Willie, has really been the options that uh, Vasin has to throw to. It, it, he's got some uh, some excellent facts. You mentioned uh, uh, Metaver. You know, you have the two brothers there, um, the, the two twins uh, that he, he can both throw to. You got Mike Kasperzik is another out option. Even someone like uh, an Owen Shanbach, who's a pay, change of pace back when they're looking to give uh, Gaffinowski a breather, he can catch passes out of the backfield. So this is not a one or even two trick pony offense. There's a lot of guys here. Luke and Logan, the TV here. Um, as I said, um, you know, we uh, Bill froze there for a second. I think he'll probably be right back with us. Matt, I just was going to add here that, uh, you know, you look at you mentioned the time that Swamps or the time that they possessed the ball over Swampscott last week. I mean, what a perfect example of that would be Owen Gazanowski, the 136 yards that you recorded in the paper this week on 31 carries. So that's 4.38 yards per carry. And that's perfect for eating the clock up. Oh, my gosh. Oh, right? Yeah, that's I mean, well. it's, it's exactly, you know, and, and that's what coach mentioned is that they wanted to you know, to be a championship team, that was the things that they had to do. And um, it was impressive. It it really was. Um, You know, I I thought, um, I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm watching the Swampska game here and um, they just lost in overtime live as we record this on a handoff to a guard uh, on the, um, on the, uh, on the two point conversion try. They lost? Yeah. Oh. What was the what score there? Uh, 20, um, 23 to 21. So Swampskit got the ball and scored, didn't get the two points. Uh, Auburn scored on a reverse on fourth and three. And then um, a guard just scored the two-point conversion. The kid stood up, pulled, took the hand off, and, and pulled up through the hole and carried the ball in there. So, um Tough way to go down. Now they got to ride back all the way home a bunch of hours, uh, you know, and, and we'll see what that does to them in the power rankings. Um, you know, j- just to touch quickly back on Danvers, they're fifth in the power rankings, uh, which is pretty good. I mean, tough to t- tough to see Foxborough in your way. They they just played a one score game with King Philip. So that's uh, ooh, that's a little bit of a yikes there. Uh, but Gloucester down at 19 too. I mean, uh, you know, depending on how far Danvers can rise, if they win out, uh, it's not inconceivable. We could see a, a Thanksgiving match in the first round uh, if Gloucester gets in, right? I mean, no, you never know. I think Gloucester has to beat uh, Beverly next weekend. That, that's the only way they're going to get in, I would say. Um, sure. No, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I if they would have beat Peabody this week, certainly <laughs> that would uh, bolster their chances. But I think that would be a difficult task for them the more realistic task is probably asking them to beat Beverly at home. Uh, Beverly is winless right now. They play Swampscott this weekend. Um, so, you know, do they go in one and six? Are they going zero and seven? Gloucester seems like they're getting back to health a little bit. They got uh, Cameron Whitfield, their quarterback back last week, although he only played wide out and kicked. They used another returning guy, uh, John Gucciotti um, under center, but Caden Souza has been playing really well. Um, for Gloucester, they had a sophomore making his first start last week that scored a couple of touchdowns, and uh, they came up really big defensively against Saga. So, um, for Gloucester to get in, it's probably going to take uh, a win over Beverly. Um, although Willie, as you've mentioned before, it's not always the wins; it's it's who you beat. And a win over a winless Beverly team, I'm not sure that's going to give them the necessary push they need. I don't know. Maybe yeah, it's playing right better now... against Peabody. Yeah. The other thing I, I we could just add here is that just the final cap on Danvers. Yes, they have Masco on Friday, and it's and we can look ahead. Uh, the coaches and the players can't look ahead, but in two weeks they'll be playing Marblehead, and both of those teams in that Dunn division are undefeated at two and zero. Oh. 
uh, after both teams with such slow with slow starts in the year. So there's there's certainly a game to watch. Well, they, speaking of big games, how about this prep uh, CM game on on Saturday? I don't I don't know what to think. Uh, what's your take on this game? It seems to me like uh, I think the prep still has some of their best football ahead, but this is going to be a tough matchup for them. I mean, it's it's oh boy, right? I mean, is it crazy? So St. John's is number one in Division One. Uh they they've destroyed every team they've played. And I gotta be honest, like I'm not sure if they're any good. And you know, I mean any good relative to the best three teams in the state, right? Uh, I mean, obviously relative to the Northeastern Conference and the Cape Ann League and, and everybody else in New England, they're very good. They're way better. We saw what they did to LaSalle. Um you know, et cetera. But, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, of the two or three teams in the state that are capable of playing with St. John's, they play one of them on Thanksgiving, right. the Varian. So so they can't see them early in the season. So in other words, you know, it's been six weeks and, and you know, it's not the prep's fault. They schedule what they think are tough teams. Uh, you know, Central Catholic's got the injury to the Clemson quarterback and, and this and that. You know, I guess week one was a pretty good opponent. You know, they, they again, the state champion of Rhode Island, they go down there. It turns out, you know, they can't cut the mustard either. So, you know, I don't say this to be critical of St. John's, but I, I just I wonder, like, these guys haven't had to to play four quarters really much. And I don't know how you prepare for a team like CM not doing that uh, other than to say that, you, you know, thank God Coach St. Pierre runs the toughest practices in Massachusetts. And that's probably why he does that. Uh, you know, so it will be great to actually see St. John's, you know, go toe to toe. Um, you know, it looks like we got some weather coming in, which I think favors St. John's. I think that, you know, they're a tough team and that's the identity that, that St. wants to have. I mean, I don't know if it's the Pittsburgh Steeler in them or I think it is, honestly, just believes that that's how you win. I mean, you know, he tells Phil that, you know, in praise of his quarterback, that he, he, he'll he never throw the ball 40 times and he, and he doesn't believe that that's the game of football. And, and it's like, well, you know, if if the game script calls for that, I mean, I, I seem to remember Jack Perry throwing the ball quite a lot, but but I understand his point. He he wants toughness and certainly a rain game favors the team with, with the toughness. And so I have no doubt in my mind that St. John's is as tough as nails in the trenches. Uh, their running backs are, are as tough as nails. They've Got a three-headed monster there now, not just with Alberti and Lagrassa, but with Jimmy Nardone, yeah. uh, you know, really being a, a varsity caliber top tier back. So, you know, they're they're gonna probably look to 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 grind CM down and and play a, a you know kind of dare CM to match them toughness wise. And you know, the thing that I don't know about St. John's is is all those skills positions that they lost from last year. I mean you know, those three amazing wide receivers and defensive backs that are all at division one colleges. Now, uh, I feel like the, the, uh, the reloading of those positions, they just haven't been tested yet. And CM's finally going to test them. So it'll be great to see, I think, uh, you know, how they match up uh, to that test, if that makes sense. That's exactly right, Willie. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a team I've seen three times, uh, played three out of their first six games. Um, and to me, it's going to be decided in two areas. It's going to be decided on the line and it's going to be decided in the prep secondary. You know, uh, if you look at the Catholic Memorial line, they have, you know, it, it's like a fleet of uh, trailer trucks you see at a rest stop on, uh, you know, the Mass Pike uh, across that line. I mean, just massive, massive uh, high school kits. Um, Ken St. John's hold their own against those guys. They've got their own really talented linemen, but can they match up against this, you know, call it 1,500 pounds collective of humanity that are going to be trying to crash through the line and get to their backs or conversely, you know, hold the fort when they're on, when CM's on offense to prevent the prep from getting after them. And secondly, you know, it, it, if there's an area that is still maybe a question mark for St. John's, it is that secondary. That's where they lost all those studs that Willie talked about um, as wide receivers last year, you know, whether it was uh, Aguero or it was um, from Salem there. Jeez, he's down at Rutgers now, Jesse O'Fury. Um, you know, guys like that, they lost that entire secondary. The guys who have stepped in have done a nice job. In fact, they've had some injuries there and they've had to rework some things. But, um, you know, how will they fare against a team that can come out and throw the ball with accuracy, with speedy receivers who are physical, 
can they match that? I think for St. John's, getting out to an early lead is really key. Um, if they can devise any kind of game plan similar to what they did last year against Springfield Cathedral, where they take the ball early, they frustrate CM offensively, get out to a lead, and then can kind of hold it from there, that will certainly work in their favor. But uh, as Willie says, this is, despite what they try to schedule, this is their first real test. Can they ace it? Yeah, they can. I mean, they have the skill. They have the players. You know, they may not have uh, anybody going to the University of Georgia on this team, but there's still a lot of talent on this team. And and conversely, as we've seen, a, a loss to CM in the regular season doesn't mean you can't have a championship season as they did a year ago. But this is a game they would love to win. They, no one's beaten CM in state since the prep did it in 2019 Super Bowl. It's homecoming at St. John's. They're going to have their Hall of Fame ceremony, which I'm really happy to say. Gene DePlacido was part of that Hall of Fame class this year. Um, she was uh, accepted into the Hall of Fame uh, before her untimely passing this summer. So uh, it's nice that she'll be recognized. Um, but there's going to be a great crowd there, no matter what the weather is going to be like. And I know the prep would really like to show that they can not only play with the Knights, but they can beat them as well. No, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a pretty solid analysis. Let me just pick on one other game here, the Thursday night game over at Fenwick. You yeah. got Ian coming in here. This is the team that knocked off Peabody. Um, sorry to bring that up, Willie, but um, last week, last year in the playoffs. But I'm hearing that this is a totally different Fian team this year, but they're still powerful and big and good. So this is a tough matchup for Fenwick Thursday night at 6. Yeah, you know, what you're hearing, Bill, is exactly what Dave Woods told me the other day. You know, it's it's not the same type style of Fian team, but they still have a lot of weapons. Um, they have a lot of players, certainly a bigger roster than Fenwick does. Um, they have that speed. They have that physicality. They can beat you in a lot of different ways. You know, Fenwick is a team I, I thought after beating Marblehead uh, in the opener, especially when the, the quarterback went down and Braden Clifford uh, stepped in for uh, Bryce. Um, Bryce Lehman, yeah. Yeah, Bryce Lehman, thank you. They've really uh, played well. I, I was surprised that they uh, lost down at Spellman two weeks ago. I know Spellman was undefeated, and it was an undefeated showdown, but I, I really expected Fenwick to win that game because they have a ton of weapons themselves. You know, and it's not just upperclassmen. They've got some really good underclassmen who are playing key roles, middle linebacker, in the slot, uh, secondary, things like that, that are stepping up and making big plays for this team. So, I think Fenwick's an underdog, but I wouldn't say I wouldn't say a win would come as a shock because I know how well they can play. I certainly know how well they're coached up. And when you have two great uh, weapons out of the backfield in Connolly and Nichols, uh, Clifford has certainly grown into his role at quarterback. Some really good weapons of Throto and Brutch and Timpson and Connolly on the wideouts and, and uh, Zamney if they need him. Um you know, Fenwick will respond in this game. You know, can they win or not? We'll find out, but they're not going to get blown out. Yeah, I, I, and they're always uh, exciting and tight, close, just kind of showdown kind of games. Uh, I don't yeah. count the Fenwick out. It's something about them. They're 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 always around. It seems like uh, and always well, they're tough kids you know, and, and they're coached yeah. really really well. I mean, Dave has a tremendous staff. Dave Woods just has a, a great staff of guys over there, and the kids buy into what they've been taught. You know, they have that rallying cry this year. We've talked about this ad nauseum about the fact that they still, you know, court litigation pending. They still are not as part of the playoff picture this year. Um, so uh, games like this are a Super Bowl uh, de facto for them. Uh, and that's how they look at it, especially with this one's at home. They lost one uh, at Spelman in the similar circumstances. Now, you know, you return home. It's a Thursday night. You get the spotlight all of yourself, at least in terms of football this week on a Thursday night. So ball out and see what you can do. I mean, you know, whatever happens in court, it's an opportunity to win a championship because, uh, you know, Fian already took care of Spellman 24 to nothing. So, I mean, if you believe in the transitive property, it's going to be a long night for Fenwick, but, but I don't, we've said that many times on the podcast that, you know, this team beating that team doesn't always mean right. anything when two, you know, styles make fights and all that good stuff. So if hey, Fenwick wins, the, you, you've the got Patriots a beat the Jets. The Jets just beat the Eagles. Does that mean the Patriots are better than the Eagles? No, right, of course exactly. not. You know, you're right. So, right. So, so Fenwick wins and, they, and they've got themselves in first place and probably a, a, a three-way CCL title. So, you know, if that in fact is the only title that they're eligible for, they, they'd certainly love to win it. So, you know, that that's certainly something. And did they beat Fian last year? I, I think they did, or, or they took them, you know, it was like seven, seven, 
uh, you know, going into the fourth. Yeah, quarter. into the fourth, and I think Fian scored like two or three late touchdowns to win. Yeah, that I game. think they, I think they finally unleashed Yanchik in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. I don't think he played much yeah. the first three. They, they kind of were, um, you know, playing the, uh, the Tim Cronin game uh, for longtime viewers of the <laughs> podcast there, but. Yeah. Um, you know, hey, nonetheless, it's always a good a good game, and and it's just one of those things like you know with Fian and Spellman, and I think we'll certainly see it in the playoffs. Uh, you know, unfortunately, even though we're North Shore guys, uh, you know, sometimes those so short teams, uh, it's just hard to stack up with them. And you know, it'd be nice if the North could could land a uh, a punch every now and then and and get some of these wins, but uh, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. Gentlemen, we're um, looking at the clock here. We have a few more minutes left. Um, Nick Giannino talked about soccer at the beginning, some boys soccer. Uh, anything else, other sports that you guys want to highlight at all uh, or, or note of things coming up in the paper this week? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we have, uh, you know, Willie's got um, both North Shore and Cape Ann girls soccer columns that'll be in uh, Wednesday's newspaper, which are both uh, great reads. I edited both of those earlier today and there's chock full of good stuff. I'll have the same with um, field hockey on Thursday. Um, we got a new uh, lacrosse coach, a new slash old lacrosse coach. As, That's uh, right. Jimmy LaSalva is back at Hamilton Wenham. He founded the program in 2000, coached them for, uh, I guess, 14 years if you count that first season as a sub varsity program. 158 wins, 12 postseason bursts. Um, left to join Beverly as alma mater, head coach there for three seasons after serving a couple as an assistant. He's been um, taking time off, um, still teaches at Hamilton Wenham, but he took a few years off from coaching at the high school level. He's coached youth, soc- youth uh, lacrosse, excuse me, and now he's back with the general. So that's a good thing for Hamilton Wenham. Um, what else do we have, Willie? Oh, Lisa Keene from Peabody won her yes. 300th match as the head coach of the Peabody High Volleyball team. Congratulations to Lisa. They're fourteen and two. Is that right, Willie? They're having a great year. Yeah, yeah. yeah they won. Uh, yeah, they lost their opener to Haverhill. Uh, they yeah. won twelve in a row, uh, which included some some wins against MVC teams. Very nice to see. Uh, lost to uh, uh, Mask and Omit last week. So one conference loss, and uh, Danvers uh, also has one conference loss. So they're going to play each other on Wednesday, which will be today, as you hear this, and that's obviously a huge game. Probably decides the NEC title. Because uh, I think Masco has a couple other losses. Uh, you know, Danvers only lost so far, I believe, is is Peabody. Uh, in yeah, I think Masco is like seven and nine. Uh, yeah, I mean, Danvers is nine and nine too with that tough schedule they play. They, they've obviously, uh, you know, played much better in league than than non league. But uh, you know, it should be a great match. Vice I mean, versa, yeah, the, you're right. Two of the deans uh, of coaching. You know, I mean, Lisa's been around for you know, going on 20 years and 300 wins. I mean, that's incredible. Uh, you know, and and George uh, really has got. A great program there in Danvers, and and I know that um, you know when Lisa started, there weren't too many teams that even had volleyball programs, and certainly no. the you know she was in the GBL at the time, and I mean Danvers, Danvers didn't even have a team, so uh, I know that um, you know for her, uh, the competition is, is as good as the wins. I mean to think that so many schools in the immediate area, you're talking about Danvers and Masco and Marblehead and and you know Beverly at times to see so many schools, uh, you know, really build volleyball cultures and, and have good feeder programs and have good teams year after year after year. Uh, you know, never mind what happens in the Cape Ann League with Ipswich and, and teams like that. Um, you know, that that's just been great for her to see. She's very happy, you know, just, just to have the competition around here. Um, it's funny, it you know, I, I watched them play. I'm dating myself, but maybe eight, ten years ago, they went 20-0 in the regular season. And I went to a playoff game they had against Haverhill, which I think was 500. And Havel beat them in straight sets. And I was like, how did this happen? And she says, well, the competition is just so much better up there. And I wasn't as well-versed at the time in volleyball. And I can't say that I am an expert at it now. But um, credit to Lisa going out and getting those in-season games. It's going to make her team tougher um, in the postseason, especially now in the area, in the uh, age of power seeding. That can only behoove her team. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and Danvers does the same thing, you know, yeah, yeah. we know, um, you know, George so knows it, every coach across the state, what the programs are. And, um, you know, it's why they play the Dennis Yartness of the world, the Arlington Catholics and things like that. So oh, I got sure, this. Yeah. I pulled my calculator out twice during this uh, podcast. Lisa Keen, I talked to her a few weeks ago. This is her 18th year, I believe. So you okay. go 300 wins, you divide that. That's like 16.6 wins per season. And this season's not even over yet. 
right? I, I think it's her 20th season, but yes, it's like. Oh, okay. 15. I thought she was 18. Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. They've had a lot of big, you know, they've had a lot of good seasons. And, and even, I, I believe last year, they made the round of 16, which, you know, yeah. in the old North would have been like a semifinal, a good tournament run. So, yeah. you know, they've had success in the tournament uh, recently too, or at least more than they used to in the old North when, when the MVC kind of ruled the roost. <clears throat> I should say, too, that, um, you know, I don't think it's a shock to anybody, but it looks like the um, Northeastern Conference field hockey crown is going to come down to next Tuesday. First place, Danvers. Second place, Gloucester. Uh, night game in Danvers at 530. Um, it's been good to see that we continue to have uh, three teams ranked in the top 10 uh, power rankings in Division Three with those two squads and, of course, Swanskett whose record um, is seven and five, but, you know, all their losses have come against power programs. So they've hung right in there. Of course, Maskinomin is a top 10 team in division two. Um, and, you know, I, I got to give a shout out. Beverly's been playing fantastic lately. They were mm -hmm. two, seven and two or two or seven and one at one point. They won four in a row, uh, including a monumental win, probably the upset of the year over Masco last week. They tied Swampskit on, um, on Monday and they host Gloucester, on uh wednesday uh that would be an even bigger win if they could upset gloucester so uh congratulations to um trish murphy and shannon silvestri and all their players uh, in beverly they've just been getting great work out of uh, lucy stevens lily shea ella malablocki um you know on and on and on just uh, elliot lund some really really good competition uh and taking care of business for beverly so nice to see them uh, bouncing back and having a good season Great job. You guys have finished strong here tonight. Uh, and um, and again, a uh, little shout out to Travis Voisin of Danvers Football. Hope he's listening here to this week's podcast from start to finish. I mean, if and if he and if he hears this part, he's a trooper. He's a real trooper. Lefty Staying power, the brother. Lefty there we power. go. <laughs> Are yeah. you a lefty? Are you a lefty? Yeah, I said that earlier. I'm a southpaw. Oh, okay. I, I I knew you said he was. I wasn't. I didn't know. You I don't have an arm like him anymore because I probably needed rotator cuff surgery about thirty years ago and never got it. But you yeah. know, that's how it goes. Fair enough. All right, gentlemen. Thank you. We'll talk again.